أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته I'd like to welcome you all to our second session on the tafsir of Surah Al-Hujurat and just to recap in our last session we mentioned that Surah Al-Hujurat is a late Madani Surah according to the majority of the Mufassireen. This is a surah that was revealed around the ninth year after the Hijrah. And it derives its name, as we mentioned, from the fourth verse of the Holy Quran, the fourth verse of the surah that mentions the word Hujurat. And the word Hujurat literally means the apartments. And it's a surah that deals with morality it deals with akhlaq and that's why many of the mufassireen they say that this surah is surah al-akhlaq wal adab that it is the surah it is the chapter on morality and ethics and we mentioned that the the surah contains 18 verses and we we divided the surah into three main sections the first five five verses deal with the proper etiquette that has to be shown to the Prophet, how Muslims are to interact with the Prophet when they encounter him, how they are to speak to him, how they are to behave in his presence. So the first part of the surah deals with akhlaq as it relates to our interactions with the Prophet. Verses 6 through 12, and inshallah we'll touch upon uh, on, uh, at least one of those verses today, Verses 6 through 12 speaks about how Muslims are to treat one another. If we're going to foster a community of brotherhood and sisterhood, what are, the, what are the things that we have to avoid? What are the things that we should do to strengthen the bonds of brotherhood? And then verses 13 to 18, Allah speaks about the true nature of faith. Now, we left off at verse number three. So the beginning of the surah, as I mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about things that we should not do in the presence of the Prophet. That, you know, do not advance before God and His Messenger. You can, we, that can be understood in a literal sense that when you're in the presence of the Prophet, don't walk in front of Him. But the main message of the verse is that do not put forward your views and your opinions do not let your desires do not give precedence to your desires and your opinions and your views over the teachings of the holy prophet and then the second verse speaks about the issue of the consequence of raising your voice in the presence of the prophet and here allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse number three he says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Inna al-lazina yaghudduna aswatahum inda Rasulillah, Ulaika al-lazina amtahana Allahu qulubahum littaqwa, lahum maghfiratu wa ajrun azim. Surely those who lower their voices before the Messenger of God, they are the ones whose hearts God has tested for piety. Theirs shall be forgiveness and a great reward. So in ayah number two, Allah spoke about, He mentions the consequence of those who raise their voices in the presence of the Prophet as a form of disrespect. Because we have to also mention parenthetically that it's not, it's not a sin to raise your voice in the presence of the Prophet unless, unless it's done in the spirit of, of disrespect. Because we have instances where individuals did raise their voices in the presence of the Prophet, but it was not done with any ill intention. In fact, it was necessary. So for example, in the battle of Hunayn that we mentioned when we covered Surah at tawbah when many of the companions started to retreat, Abdul Muttalib, uh, 
Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, the uncle of the Prophet, he started to shout and yell, telling everybody to come back, that, oh, oh warriors of Badr, where are you retreating? So Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, he's, he raises his voice in the presence of the Prophet. But here it's necessary. So it's not forbidden in the absolute sense. It's forbidden to raise your voice in the presence of the Prophet when it's done out of disrespect or to undermine the Prophet. So Allah speaks about the consequence of those who disrespect the Prophet, who raise their voices in his presence. And we mentioned that it nullifies all of your past deeds, assuming that someone doesn't repent. Now here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the reward granted to those who observe the proper etiquette when they are in the presence and when they interact with the Prophet. So Allah here speaks about the reward that will be granted to those who have adab, who have akhlaq with the Prophet, and particularly those who lower their voices when they are in his company. Allah says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَغُضُّونَ أَصْوَاتَهُمْ عِنْدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ امْتَحَنَ اللَّهُ قُلُوبَهُمْ لِلتَّقْوَىٰ That those who lower their voices, who pay attention to the volume of their voices, عِنْدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ When they are in the company of the Prophet, the Messenger of God, أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ امْتَحَنَ اللَّهُ قُلُوبَهُمْ لِلتَّقْوَىٰ That these are the ones whom God has tested for piety. Now it's interesting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the word taqwa when he speaks about how the companions are interacting with the Prophet. So taqwa is not just about you know who's praying behind the Prophet. Taqwa is not just about who is you know who goes to jihad with the prophet taqwa is not about who goes to hajj with the prophet it's also about how these companions are behaving with the prophet so taqwa is about having this self control it's about it implies good character it applies it implies having good manners in the company of the prophet these are people who have taqwa so we shouldn't assume, the ayah is teaching us that do not assume that every companion of the Prophet has taqwa. Declaring faith, saying la ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah, that's a declaration of faith. Piety, as, as, as mentioned in this verse, imtahan Allahu qulubahum taqwa that taqwa is something that's related to the heart. that someone may pray behind the Prophet. They might even go for jihad. They might go to hajj with the Prophet. But that doesn't mean that they have taqwa. That those who have taqwa, one of the signs of taqwa is that you have to, you have, to have etiquette. You have to respect the Prophet. You have to honor the Prophet. You should not exhibit coarse or crude manners in the company of the Prophet. So taqwa, you, you cannot say that someone has taqwa unless they're tested. So the ayah here says, That taqwa is only manifested after there's a trial, after there's a test. Now, someone may be a Muslim just by reciting the shahada, but taqwa is something that can only be ascertained after there's a test. So for example, the Battle of Hunayn, that was, a, that was an instance where Allah separated. There, were, there's a, there was a clear distinction between those who had taqwa and those who didn't. And the Battle of Uhud, other instances where faith was tested. So taqwa is only, is only revealed when there is an imtihan, when there is a trial. So taqwa is only known after a trial. Now, as I mentioned in our last session, that 
because the Prophet ﷺ was so kind, because he was so merciful and approachable and sociable, many of the companions of the Prophet, they started to get too comfortable with the Prophet. You know, when you're close to someone, you know, you kind of, you know, set aside formalities and certain protocols and certain etiquettes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here reminds the Muslims that do not take advantage of the kindness and the humility and the humbleness of the Prophet. Yes, he's down to earth, he's approachable, but that doesn't mean that you need to abandon your manners. You have to have akhlaq. That someone's humility and kindness is not an invitation for you to cross the red lines, to transgress, to misbehave. To be impolite. لَهُمْ وَأَجْرٌ عَظِيمٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that those who respect the Prophet, you know, there are many ways to earn Allah's forgiveness. Sometimes you do it formally through istighfar, through tawbah. But there are also certain actions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so pleased with that He, he forgives past sins. So for example, the ones who people who pray Salatul Layl, standing in the middle of the night, as the hadith says, washes away the sins that were committed during the day. So Salatul Layl is one of the gateways to God's forgiveness. Another gateway to Allah's forgiveness is what? Lowering your voice in the presence of the Prophet. Having manners. When you interact with the Prophet, this is one of the ways of earning Allah's maghfirah. وَأَجْرٌ عظيم. You notice that Allah mentions maghfirah, forgiveness, and then He mentions a great reward. Because you, are only, you will only be granted a great reward after you have been granted forgiveness, after God has pardoned you. And one of the ways to attract divine mercy and to attract the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to always show respect to the Messenger of God. Now, the, the respect to the Messenger of God can, can, be, can be displayed and exhibited in many ways. One of them is to lower your voice in His presence. You know, other ways of honoring the Prophet is to hold sessions where you, know, you study the Prophet's biography. You know, celebrating the birth of the Prophet. There are many ways that we can honor the Prophet and show our reverence to the Prophet. So this is one of the ways that we gain Allah's forgiveness. Respecting and honoring the Prophet. And this principle, this, you know, this idea of lowering your voice in the presence of the Prophet doesn't only apply to when he is alive. So some scholars they use this verse to argue that even when you go on ziyarah, even when you go to the Prophet's mosque in Medina, even when you go to his grave, that when you recite ziyarah, that when you speak to the Prophet, when you address him, you shouldn't raise your voice. Because the Prophet ﷺ, even though he physically died 14 centuries ago, he's still alive. As Allah says about the martyrs in, in Surah Ali Imran, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ قُتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتٌ بَلْ أَحْيَاءٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ يُرْزَقُونَ That do not consider those who have been killed in the way of God to be dead. They are alive in the, and they are receiving sustenance in, with their Lord. So if martyrs, if shuhada are alive and God forbids us from he forbids us from referring to them as being dead then the prophet sallallahu surely is alive because no one can achieve martyrdom without acknowledging his nubuwa so even when we go to visit the prophet sallallahu and some scholars even extend this to all of the other masumin that when you go towards them towards their graves, and you want to address them, do not shout, do not yell, lower your voice, speak in a very balanced way.
Verse number four, Allah says, "Inna ladina yunadu na kamin wara al hujurat akfaruhum la yaqilun." Surely those who call, who call you from behind the apartments, most of them do not understand. Now, in order for you to understand the verse, you have I have to put it in, in its context. You know, brothers and sisters, the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ was built in such a way that you have the masjid and then connected to the masjid, the Prophet built certain rooms, small apartments for each of his wives. So this is the meaning of hujurat. Hujurat, it means apartments. And this is where the surah takes its name. Now, so the Prophet's house, his living space, was adjacent to the masjid. So the way it was is the Prophet would open his door and his door would open into the masjid. So each of his wives, they had their own living quarters. And all of these living quarters had doors. And each of these doors would open up into the masjid. So the Prophet ﷺ essentially lived in the masjid. Or he, his house was attached to the masjid. So... You, so the, everyone knew where the Prophet lived. So when people would come to the masjid, they knew that the Prophet lives, you know, in in this in these living quarters, which are attached to the masjid. Now, in the ninth year after the hijrah, we mentioned that the ninth year after the hijrah was known as Amul Wufud, the year of delegations. This is when we see a a huge influx of people coming into the fold of Islam. After, after Mecca was conquered, that's when the floodgates opened and people started to enter Islam in large groups. Entire tribes were becoming Muslim. Now many of them, they descended upon Medina. They wanted to come to Medina. They wanted to meet the Prophet. They wanted to speak to the Prophet. You know, many of these tribes, they lived in the outskirts of Medina. So they arrive in Medina. And it's not that they have to really ask, you know, where does the Prophet, the, the Prophet, his living, his living quarters were attached to the masjid. So there was a tribe, and we mentioned this last week. There was a tribe, a, a very a major tribe called the tribe of Banu Tamim. They were among those who converted. And they come to the Prophet It's a major tribe, a very prominent Arab Arabian tribe. So they come to the masjid, and they don't know which which of the living quarters the Prophet is staying in because he had multiple wives. So they would stand in the masjid, or maybe even outside of the masjid, and they would yell. They would call out. Ya Muhammad, ukhruj ilayna. So number one, they don't, they don't address him as the messenger of God. They say, oh Muhammad. Oh Muhammad, come out, come out. We're here for you. The Prophet ﷺ in their narration say that he was sleeping. He was you know, with his family. And they're standing outside of his door, outside of the apartments. And they're shouting. They're demanding that the Prophet comes out. Now, just as a side note, so the Prophet has all of these living quarters. And also the house of Ali and Fatima was also attached to the masjid. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Jibra'il, He reveals that all of the doors that open up into the masjid they have to be closed permanently. Meaning, if one of your wives wants to come to the masjid, 
she cannot enter the masjid directly. She has to go outside and then come inside of the masjid. So the command, because some of them, you know, were not, they were not ritually pure. They were maybe in, in, a, in a state of hayd or janaba, whatever it may be. So Allah commands all of the doors to be shut. Except for the door of Ali and Fatima. They were the only ones who were allowed to enter the masjid directly from their homes. So their door was the only door that was permitted to remain open. That they could open up their door and walk in the masjid. Everybody else, they had to go out and come in through the main entrance. Now, as you can imagine, you know, some, some became jealous. You know, some of them started to harbor ill feelings towards Ali and Fatima alayhi salam. So this is what happened. So all of these doors are closed. And therefore, when, when people wanted to call upon the Prophet, many of them, they would stand and they would shout. Some of them would stand outside of the masjid. Some of them would come in the masjid and they would shout out from behind the, uh, the apartments. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, th this was not just one occurrence. This seemed to be happening quite often where people would surround the Prophet's living quarters and they would shout and they would call him out, they call out his name, pressuring him to come out and meet them, being obnoxious and rowdy. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when this happens, you know, when this becomes a growing problem, Allah reveals this verse. And we mentioned the incident of, of Abu Bakr and Umar arguing and yelling at one another as to who is... You know, who should receive the delegation of Banu Tamim? In any case, there are many companions. And it's not just the, the newcomers to Islam. We're not just talking about new converts. This was a problem among senior companions, and it was a problem among converts. It seems that many people, many of the companions, were not observing the proper etiquette with the Prophet. They were raising their voices. They were calling out to him when he was with his family. Now you can imagine how difficult it is, you know, perhaps only resident scholars know what it feels like to live inside of the masjid and have people, you know, constantly invade your privacy. So the prophet as his privacy was being invaded. He wasn't able to spend any quiet time with his family. When they would call upon him they would shout and yell. So Allah reveals this verse, "Inna alladhina yunadunaka min wara'il hujurat." Those these people who are calling upon you, who are yelling from behind the apartments, most of them do not understand. La yaqilun. They're not rational people. They have no aql. They don't have intellect. They don't have adab. And you find, brothers and sisters, that even though this verse is speaking about a, a specific incident, it really teaches us an important Islamic principle. And that is that when we speak, we, we should not raise our voices when we interact with people, unless it's necessary. But generally, when we interact, when we speak, when we communicate, we don't need to raise our voices. We don't need to yell. We don't need to be obnoxious. And this is one of the pieces of advice that Luqman, Luqman, Luqman al-Hakim, there's Surah number 31 of the Qur'an is named after Luqman, this, this pious, wise personality. One of the things that Luqman says to his son, he gives him different pieces of advice. One of the things that he says to his son is, وَقْصِدْ فِي مَشْيِكْ وَغْضُضْ مِنْ صَوْتِكْ That... وَقْصِدْ فِي مَشْيِكْ Meaning that walk at an average pace. So Luqman even tells his son, you know, be dignified even in the way that you walk. Do not be hasty in the way that you walk. Do not walk too slow and do not walk too fast. Walk at an average pace. It's, it's a more dignified way of walking. Walk humbly. Walk at a at a reasonable pace. 
Luqman says to his son, and lower your voice. Do not be a loud person. You know, don't you know? There's a saying that goes, you know, don't raise your voice. Improve your argument. You know, many times you see people, you know, debating and discussing, and people start getting really loud. They get very obnoxious because they want to get their point across. They think that you know, raising their voice is gonna is gonna add credibility. That it's gonna bolster their their argument. Improve. You know, don't raise your voice. Improve your argument. Speak in a very moderate tone. Be balanced. The most despicable sounds is the sound that the donkey makes. Meaning that, do not be obnoxious. Mu'mineen, believers, are not supposed to be obnoxious. You have to be pleasant. Even when you speak, you have a soothing voice. You're not loud. Everything is balanced about the believer. Everything is moderate about the believer. They're moderate in, in the pace, in their pace when they walk. They're moderate in their, in their speech. The volume of their speech is balanced. So this is all about being civil. You know, if we want to create a community where there's mutual respect, we have to be civil with each other. We cannot yell at each other. We cannot disrespect each other. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number five, وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ صَبَرُوا حَتَّى تَخْرُجَ إِلَيْهِمْ لَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورُ الرحيم. Had they been patient until you came out to them, it would have been better for them. And God is forgiving and merciful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to these people that they were, you know, they were shouting the Prophet's name. Allah says that it would have been better if you were patient, if you waited for the Prophet to come out. And God is forgiving and merciful. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He reprimands the believers, and then he ends, and this is one of the beauties of the Qur'an. Whenever, when Allah reprimands, he usually ends the conversation by reminding us of his mercy. So Allah reprimands, he admonishes, and then he says what? Wallahu ghafoor rahim That God is forgiving, he's merciful. That Allah is not, Allah is reprimanding you because he wants to inspire change in you. He wants you to rectify your behavior. He wants you to improve your conduct. Allah says, you, it would have been better if you were patient and you waited for the Prophet to come out. Meaning, don't be hasty. You know, brothers and sisters, sometimes we think that doing things in haste is always better. You know, especially in today's world, what do we want? We want everything quickly. You know, we want our meals quickly. We want anything that we order online to arrive quickly. We want to solve problems quickly. We want to make snap decisions. You know, when, when, there's, when, when there's an argument or a fight, we want to react immediately. We have to always remember that it's dangerous to act in haste. There are many ahadith from the Ahlul Bayt السلام, where they speak about the reprehensibility of being hasty. Al Ajala. Even in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He says, You know, when, when bad things happen to us, when we want something from Allah, we make dua right away. And Allah says, you know, when we're afflicted with calamities and trials, we want them to go away quickly. You know, we want things to be resolved instantly through our dua. But Allah says, وَكَانَ الْإِنسَانُ عَجُولًا That people have, this na people have a natural tendency to be hasty. And we see it today all over the place. That people, they don't have patience. 
They, they react quickly. The Prophet ﷺ in a hadith, he says, إِنَّمَا أَهْلَكَ النَّاسَ الْعَجَلَ وَلَوْ أَنَّ النَّاسَ تَثَبَّتُوا لَمْ يَهْلِكُ أَحَدٌ The Prophet ﷺ, he says, what has caused people to, to perish and to ruin their lives is being hasty. And then the Prophet says that if people deliberated, if people were patient and they gave thought to their actions, no one would perish. Meaning that you wouldn't destroy your life. But oftentimes what happens? You know, you, you, know, you need to make a decision about something. And you want to make a decision overnight. You know, you get a job offer and you want to decide that minute. You want to decide where to move. You want to make a decision right away. It's important for us to deliberate, not to not make hasty decisions. Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he says, Al ajalu yujibu al ithar. That if you're hasty, you will stumble, you will make mistakes. So we have, we have certain narrations that condemn being hasty. Imam, the Imam alayhi salam, he says, Ma'al ajal yakthuru zalan. That when you are hasty, you are prone to making many mistakes. So you have all of these ahadith that condemn, that warn us about being too hasty, that we have to give things some thought. And then we have another set of narrations where the Ahlul Bayt السلام, speak about the virtue of being hasty. Now, there's a hadith where the Imam السلام, reconciles these two groups of narrations. He says, that it's the Imam السلام, says, Deliberation, being patient, is a virtue except when there is an opportunity to do good. So for, for example, there is an opportunity to sponsor an orphan or to give money to the poor. When it comes to these issues, be hasty. Give. Don't give it a second thought. When it comes to the time of your prayers, be hasty. Hasten towards the prayer. But when it comes to other worldly affairs, give it some more thought. When it comes to conflict resolution, when it comes to anything other than doing good deeds, deliberate. Give it some thought. Do not be hasty. Some of the commentators, they say that one of the reasons why Banu Tamim came to see the Prophet is that some of their tribesmen, some of the members of their tribe, they were prisoners. And because some of them fought the Prophet in, some, in the previous battle. So they were war prisoners. And they had come to ask the Prophet ﷺ to release them. So the ayah, some of the commentators, they say that the Prophet, so they, they were shouting his name and the Prophet came out. And he said that half of them are free and the other half, you know, will ransom them. That you pay and then they'll be released. Some of the Mufassireen, they say, what Allah is saying here is that if you were patient and you waited for the Prophet to come out, he would have freed all of them and there would have never been a ransom. So, had they been patient until you came out to them, it would have been better. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is saying that good things come to those who are patient. And even in the way that Allah created the universe, the natural order of things is a testament to this. When we plant a seed, Allah has created the natural world in a way 
You know, when you plant a seed, you're not going to get a tree right away. You're not going to get a plant right away. Allah has created the natural world in a way where when you plant a seed, you have to wait. You have to be patient. And after that period of waiting, something good will come out of it. You're going to have a tree that will bear fruit. It will cast shade. It will provide oxygen. It will oxygenate the environment. There are many benefits. When a woman becomes pregnant, does she deliver right away? The moment on the night of conception, is it also the night of delivery? It doesn't happen that way. Allah says you, you remain patient. After nine months, you receive a child. And there are many examples of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creating things in a way where there is a lot of goodness that comes after a period of waiting. So had they been patient until you came out to them, it would have been better for them. And this applies to, to almost all areas of our lives. That if you're patient, that if you're not hasty, you will see khair, you will see goodness. Wallahu ghafoorur rahim. Thank you. And also uh, in verse 3, you talk about taqwa being only manifested after there's a test. Um, is it that a test is required for taqwa to occur or is it that uh, you just won't know for sure if taqwa is there uh, without the test now <clears throat> if if there wasn't now every human being is tested there's there's no such thing as a person who goes through life without being tested now one of the you know imtihan or ibtila, and these are terms that are used in the Quran. They, 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 you know, you could say that they serve two functions. They foster and they facilitate spiritual growth, because one of the ways in which Allah strengthens us is that He puts us through trials. You know, trials. If you respond to trials the way that Allah wants you to respond, then they will facilitate your spiritual growth. But definitely, they, they also uh, reveal, they reveal uh, and they manifest uh, the taqwa that is in the heart. So taqwa is, you know, so ibtila and imtihan, is, it's, it's, a necess it's necessary to develop uh, taqwa. But, uh, but it, it also, it's also one of the ways in which it's, uh, it's manifested. That you're not going to know if someone is truly pious, until, for example, they're in a position of power and they have, you know, Baytul Mal under their uh, under their control. So, 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 ibtila facilitates and it can strengthen someone's taqwa and their piety and their spirituality. And at the same time, it's a way for us to distinguish between those who have taqwa and those who don't have taqwa. That sounds a little bit like taqwa is. Kind of like a muscle where you can't. You, in order to strengthen it, you need you need to face some resistance. Exactly, exactly. That's that's a good way of thinking of it.